A dark fleet tanker flees the scene of a fiery accident, deaths from enclosed space incidents, and the best earnings for shipping in 15 years. All these stories and much more in the latest episode of Maritime in Minutes. Hi, it's Marcus Hand, editor of Sea Trade Maritime News here, with our July news roundup, Maritime in Minutes, and I'm joined by our correspondent, Gary Howard. If I had to pick a theme for this episode, it would be bad news equals good markets and earnings for shipping companies. That's obviously rather an oversimplification of things, as it and isn't always the case. Just ask the port of Iliad, and more on that later in this episode. To kick us off, I'm going to hand over to Gary. And what do you have for us all the way back at the start of July, Gary? Thanks, Marcus. It feels like a lifetime ago already. This might go against our broad understanding of the container shipping market, but my first pick was a story from Nick Savides on a potential shortage of container ships in the short to medium term. Now, we're specifically talking about feeder vessels here. The container ship order book is otherwise in a pretty robust health. But for smaller ships, which connect the sort of spoke to hub in the maritime supply chains, a lack of ordering activity and aging fleet are threatening to bring tight supply. Braemar researcher Jonathan Roach sees the order book for 1,000 to about 3,000 TU ships as below the expected level of scrapping, leading, of course, to vessel numbers falling over time. Nick's article goes into detailed stats from MDS Transmodal on fleet age and order book size by feeder ship range, sort of by every thousand TEU, which are not best suited to listing in an audio format, but they're there and they seem to report Roach's outlook. Dynamar's Darren Wadey thinks there are some novel solutions to this issue, including adding mainline services to ports that are currently being served by feeders. Varying regional environmental regulations currently sort of limit the scope to redeploy feeder vessels between regions, and the long-term solution to that problem is fleet renewal, basically, he told Nick. For those out there used to thinking in timelines of large container ships with long build times and sort of scarce slot availability at the moment, things aren't quite the same for feeders. Feeder ships take around a year to build and there's a greater number of yards and slots available to build them if you need one in a hurry. Well worth checking out the details in the story. If nothing else, it will help your understanding should owners keep declining the opportunity to send their ships for recycling in the coming months and years. Over to you, Marcus. Yeah, thanks, Gary. That's some quite an interesting take there from Nick on that but, you know, specific market segment. I'm going to look at something quite different. In early July, we had the first in a new quarterly contribution reviewing maritime security in the Asian region, which has been contributed by risk intelligence analyst Thomas Timlin. There was an excellent piece that covered the broad range of maritime security. Thomas looked at the geopolitical situation and the tensions in the South China Sea between China, Taiwan and the Philippines and whether this was actually having any real impact. And then something else that definitely is having an impact, if on a much smaller sort of scale, though, and that is the opportunistic robberies in the Singapore Strait and also in the ports in Bangladesh. Thomas explores the frequencies of incidents and the accuracy of figures that are actually reported, especially with less serious incidents, where often people see it's too much trouble to actually bother to report them, so there's kind of quite serious under-reporting. Now, Thomas draws a lot of his figures from Recap, and I'll make, just make mention of the work that that organisation has been doing on trying to uncover a black market for engine spares in Southeast Asia. Engine spares are a specific target for robbers hitting vessels in the Singapore and Malacca Strait. You don't see that in other areas. And it was something they discussed at a media briefing in the following week, and we covered on Sea Train Maritime News. I'll put a a link to that in the show notes, as well as the analysis from Risk Intelligence. If you're enjoying the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on the app of your choice. over to you for the second week of the month week two getting closer and i'm going to open up my inbox to some angry emails i feel i've picked a story on lng and methane slip i think anyone in the maritime industry has a right to feel unsure maybe even skeptical about the real impact of methane slip on total greenhouse gas emissions from lng powered ships but there is a drive for greater transparency and more accurate data recording on these emissions this story is on the mami not 
to be confused with your colleagues who have taken up road cycling, the Methane Abatement in Maritime Innovation Initiative is a group led by Lloyd's Register Safety Tech Accelerator, and they produced their first findings report, which essentially says, we need guidelines to establish a, a universal and consistent way of measuring methane emissions from ships. The scope of the report isn't limited just to methane slip, although I believe that is the main component of methane emissions. Leaks and releases during bunkering and other onboard procedures are also there to be measured and hopefully prevented. The reason this all matters is that LNG has been promoted as and adopted as a means of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from ships. I think the common figure is about a 20% reduction in emissions from burning LNG compared to heavy fuels. What's not clear is to what extent that saving is offset by the release of methane, which is the main component of LNG and is 28 times as potent a greenhouse gas over a 100 year time frame and 84 times greater over a 20 year time frame. Of course, green lobbies say there's loads of methane emissions, engine manufacturers and other vested interests say that the environmentalists have got their figures wrong and nobody ends up any the wiser. I personally think the debate has a bit of a whiff of oil money to it sometimes, but that's a separate story. The reason these methane emissions can be kept reasonably quiet and obfuscated for now is that emissions regulations at the moment in maritime are almost entirely focused on CO2. That is changing in the EU and is expected to change at the IMO in the next couple of years, as the report notes. The good news from MAMI is that, <laughs> such a weird thing to say, is that there are technologies out there to measure these emissions. They just need proper testing and maybe some adaption for use in maritime settings. Marinizing, I suppose they call it. The story contains a link to download the report, which contains advice to ship owners throughout. It's really well structured and a pretty decent read. Hopefully, the call for an agreed means of measuring methane emissions will be great news to environmentalists and the LNG lobby alike who will agree terms and let the data speak for itself. What do you think of the odds of that one, Marcus? Ah, uh, yes. Well, probably about as likely as we're going to get a sensible acronym for a shipping organisation. But it would actually be good if they could agree and we could get set some standards like this. Because I, I find one of my problems with this is that I find it just kind of a bit too adversarial. It's like, we can only use green fuels. Anything fossil fuels based is a waste of time. But the reality is the green fuels aren't really there yet in the quantities we need. So there probably does need to be a middle path. Absolutely. Just look at Musk, you know, turning to LNG from... Well, not necessarily from methanol, but adopting some LNG ships recently. That's quite a big change. I'm going to turn my attention to something quite different, but another big ongoing story. And that is the disruption that's been caused by the Red Sea Crisis. Overall, the Red Sea Crisis has actually been rather good for much of shipping in terms of earnings. And that's something we'll be discussing later in this episode. However, if you own infrastructure in the region... The effects it's having are rather more negative, as diversions from the Cape of Good Hope mean less customers, and this has been perhaps most obviously evidenced by the performance of the Suez Canal. The most read story on Sea Trade Maritime News in July was actually on the port of Eliat in Israel. Situated on Israel's southern Red Sea coast, the impact of the Houthi attacks on shipping has drastically reduced that port's volume of business, pushing it into bankruptcy. Our correspondent Nick Savidi has reported that the Port of Iliad had been forced to ask the Israeli government for financial assistance after volumes dropped by 85%. In fact, it could be even more than that, because in a meeting with the Israeli Parliament or Knesset Economic Affairs Committee on 7th of July, the port's CEO Gideon Goldberg said there had been no activity at the port for eight months and no revenues coming in. So pretty obvious to see what the problem is there. Port of Eliad is the first facility in the region to see such a drastic loss of business, and yes, Israel itself is a specific target of the Houthi's aggression and people who use its ports. However, it appears there is no end in sight to this crisis, so it may well not be the last infrastructure facility to seek help. Gary, back to you. Week three, an intermanager released some data on accidents on ships as it submitted its information to the IMO for a meeting later in July. The association's data shows that the number of accidents on ships remained pretty stable between 2022 and 2023, which understandably framed as not decreasing. Intermanager would like to see fewer accidents on ships. 
Even more worrying, though, was an increase in casualties from closed space incidents. There were 14 such incidents, both in 2022 and 2023, but 18 casualties in 2022 and 34 casualties in 2023. Enclosed space incidents are not unique to shipping, and there are plenty of reports of similar events happening on land. Someone enters an enclosed space and is either overcome by fumes or is quickly incapacitated by by lack of oxygen. And then a, a would-be rescuer goes in to, to try and find out what's wrong and succumbs to the, the same situation. As well as being tragic, the increase in casualties is worrying due to the, the efforts that there have been to promote the dangers of enclosed spaces to seafarers and all of the training around that. The data perhaps suggesting that there's a, a new tactic or a new focus is in order. Now, Intermanager itself didn't call for this. It, it instead noted that there is a lag between an incident happening and receiving reports in the IMO's Global Integrated Shipping Information System. They also noted several instances where accidents were reported in the media and in online forums, but never made it into the IMO system. So Intermanager's call from this data was for greater transparency on incidents, quicker and more detailed reporting, including creating specific categories within data collection systems to help better review procedures, improve safety and minimize accidents. There are more stats in the full story and hopefully it will serve as a reminder to renew safety efforts across the industry, even where perhaps we thought there was enough already in place. Marcus? Yeah, I think one of the things that's actually most depressing about that is something you mentioned there, that actually a lot of the people who die in these incidents are people who are going to try and help someone else who's got into trouble. I've seen uh, things on this before by a P&I club a presentation and it's really quite shocking some actual good news in this podcast and um, across July we have been focusing on the outlook for shipping markets with Maritime Strategies International. This is something we do on a six monthly basis. The series comes in the form of a single podcast episode of around 40 minutes which is on this channel and five shorter individual bonus episodes also on this channel and we also feature those as stories on Sea Trade Maritime News looking at the individual sectors. A theme that comes through this Market Outlook series, um, the most recent one we've done, is that shipping is doing rather well right now. Well, actually, according to Adam Kemp, Managing Director of MSI, for many sectors, the best earnings we've seen in 15 years. There are a number of reasons for this. Global economic growth has accelerated, and seaborne cargo demand is growing at 2%, while most sectors of shipping are seeing a constrained supply of tonnage. But the real big factor behind shipping's best performance in a decade and a half is events around the world, and more specifically the Red Sea Crisis. Now, clearly having ships fired upon by the Houthi militia is not good news for shipping companies. But having to divert via the Cape of Good Hope on voyages between Asia and Europe and Asia and the US East Coast has done marvels for the tonne-mile equation and the balance between demand and supply for many sectors. It does vary by sector and, and subsector, but has driven rates for many parts of shipping to levels that really just were not anticipated six months ago. Looking ahead, Adam said shipping was doing very well as it approached the second half of the year, and this bodes positively for owners in the remainder of 2024. Well, let's hope those earnings have all been put to good use because uh, Zanetta has noted a blip which could signal a change in in the box trade. The mid-July general rate increase was not backed by all lines, giving shippers a chance to to shop around a little bit for a deal. While a $50 drop in a 40-foot box on the Far East to US West Coast is a small change to quite a big number, Zanetta said it could be a small crack in the dam and a sign of a, a shift in the power balance. There are plenty of reasons shippers might not see tumbling rates in the coming months, labor disputes in the US and Europe, potential political shift in the US, or demand dropping off after a much discussed early peak season. But let's not forget the real cause of high rates, and that's the Red Sea crisis. Nick has another story in the same week on the Red Sea crisis hitting its peak impact on container shipping as line schedules are fully adjusted to rerouting. Search for Red Sea crisis reaches peak impact on box ships on seatrademaritime.com for that story as well. Thanks, Gary. And we've had a lot on the Red Sea crisis in this episode, but I think that just underscores how much impact it is having on shipping. Moving on to another topic. Um, The Dark or Shadow Fleet was back in the news with the fiery collision between the Singapore-registered product tanker Hafnia Nile and the Sawatomi and Principe registered VLCC Series 1 off the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia. 
The collision took place on 19th of July, and a rescue operation saw two of the crew of 40 from the VLCC being airlifted to hospital in Singapore. All 22 crew on board the Hafni and Nile were rescued and transferred back to Singapore on a naval vessel. However, 24 crew remained on the series 1, ostensibly for firefighting, but as we reported the following Monday, there was rather more to this story. Over the weekend, the Series 1 went dark, turning off its AIS transponder, and disappeared. The Malaysian authorities went in search of the missing tanker, and found it 28 nautical miles northeast of Tioman, being towed away by two tugboats. The Malaysian authorities detained the Series 1 and arrested the two tugboats. They have since towed the VLC back to a port in Malaysia. Contradicting earlier statements, the Director General of the Malaysian Marine Department, Captain Mohammed Halim Ahmed, said on the 30th of July that the Series 1 did not flee the scene, and rather its anchor chain was cut in the collision, causing the tanker to drift. For the last six years, it's been owned and operated by a little-known Chinese company, Shanghai Prosperity Management. And according to Reuters, its last cargo in March this year was sanctioned Iranian crude. Saotomi and Principe is hardly a major flag state. I'll be honest, I had to look the country up on a map to find out where it was. According to the Equasis database, the tanker's last port state control inspection was in 2019. And there are questions as to whether the vessel has any insurance. That must be particularly unwelcome news to the owners of the Hafnium Nile, I'm sure. All being said and done, the accident highlights the very real dangers to life and the environment that the Dark Fleet poses. Fortunately, no one died this time, but next time we may not be so lucky. And for the last week of the month, Gary is off on a much-deserved holiday, so I'll be handling that myself. Thanks, Marcus. See you on the next one. Since July ends midweek, I've chosen one story to round out this episode, and that is on the latest quarterly Seafarers Happiness Index. The index is based on a quarterly survey by the Mission to Seafarers, and attempts to quantify the state of crew welfare. In the second quarter of 2024, the index showed a very marginal improvement over the first quarter. However, while the overall picture may be improving, there were concerns over a growing gap between the two classes of seafarers in terms of welfare and living conditions on board ships. A digital divide was highlighted between those serving on ships where owners and managers had invested in connectivity services and seafarers were able to enjoy regular contact with family and friends and those with restricted connectivity, limited bandwidth or simply no crew internet provision. Another division was also noted between seafarers on board tankers and those on dry bulk and container ships in terms of preparedness for new fuels. Those on board tankers said they felt well prepared and qualified, while crew on board bulkers and container vessels felt left behind in this crucial area. Now this in part can be put down to the fact that seafarers on board tankers are used to handling hazardous liquid cargoes, but does point to a worrying trend for the future. As the rate of technology adoption accelerates, the disparities between vessels at the front of the curve and those behind it will likely widen, and this is something the industry will need to address. That's all we have time for on this episode. If you want to learn more about this and all the stories featured in this episode, links are in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to joining you on the next episode of the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast. <laughs>